views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey everybody, I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for checking it out. Welcome to Open BX RX. We have another, yet another fantastic show lined up for you today. In fact, coming up on today's show, we'll speak to a musician to learn about his latest work. All that coming your way. And then let's we'll speak to a director and a choreographer to learn about uh, how one uh, project is empowering people with black and brown communities. After that, we'll hear from the founder of a platform that is providing opportunities for local writers to share their stories. And then my man, Bobby C is gonna be laying in the cut with the latest in the world of sports. And then lastly, we'll hear from uh, a city council nominee who shares his vision for the communities he serves. So, kick off your shoes and relax your feet. All of this coming your way next on Open. It's another day, another way. Good morning, I'm the Dr. Bob Lee, your host, and you're watching Open. It's that live interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. So you can stay connected to us through social media at BronxNet TV. Leading things off, our first guest is a singer, composer, and lyricist. He does his thing. Dr. Eric B. Turner. We call him Dr. B or Eric Turner. Let's call him Eric Turner because he's on another mission right now. Will explain. He joins us today to promote his latest hit single, Ain't No Good. So please welcome to the show, Eric B. Yes, yes, show. You look a little like Teddy Pendergrass right now. Hey, then I'm then the job is being done then. If, if that's all. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now I, 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 I was I met you through um well CeeLo's restaurant, Elliot from CeeLo's, from CeeLo's restaurant in the in the Bronx. We actually met in 2005 at the summer stage. He gave me a call. He said, yo, he said, you got to hear my brother. Uh, he said, you got to check him out. And that's when we started, you know, to interact. You sent me some, uh, some information and some, some music. And I said, yo, you got it going on. So what inspired you to become a singer, Eric? Actually, I've been singing my entire life. Uh, yeah. Have been. I've been uh, involved in the church, was born and raised in the church and singing and knew from a young age that I wanted to be an entertainer. And so I have uh, started out on this mission, moving here to New York in 2005. Yeah. Uh, July 21st, the day we actually met, July 21st, that Thursday on Summer Stage, uh, 125th Street. Yeah. And it's been smooth, not smooth selling, but it's been a great ride since that time. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, you do a lot of things in the community, too, because we were out feeding people in Harlem, and you came out and uh, you saw some of the work that we do, and Absolutely. I know that that's one of the things that you're into. Community service is extremely important, uh, just the act of giving back. I believe in the boomerang effect. What you throw out will come back yeah. to you, so be it as an individual, be it with my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, I'm uh -oh. going to, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> To make sure that the community is being impacted by our presence. Yeah. Now you've performed, you've been doing it since, you know, a, a, a youngster and you perform with so many great artists over the years. Who has had the greatest impact in your life? Ooh, that would be. And there's been a few of them. So, you know, it's going to be tough. Quite a, it's really been quite a few. But I will say the last individual I sang background for probably had the greatest impact of where I am now, who is Mariah Carey. Oh. Who, to me, she said to me, basically, it's a now or never moment for you. And to Ooh. launch, and she really set me up on that pathway to launch to be who I am, 
have what I have now. So I'm, I'm internally grateful to her. Me and Mariah. <laughs> Not that far back, but yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So you have the new single out because you have a few of them. I heard a few of them. But yes. uh, talk about your latest single. So How did that Ain't, come about? Ain't No Good is uh, really, it derives a lot of people are questioning where, where would this song come from? Uh, being with my background in mental health, um, I'm always dealing with individuals who are making choices or decisions and they go into it knowing that it's not good for them. And yeah. so hence the opening line, you know, stop being so thirsty <laughs> for the things that you know that aren't good for you. But what I did was I needed to cleverly wrap this warning or, or message of caution into a down home, uh, deep into the South, back in the juke joint uh, flavor. So it's like a, a blues genre flavor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ah, and so, right. uh, you know, people can get the message while they groove at the same time, not really knowing that it's, it's entering into their subconscious unknowingly. So we, we love that. Now, you said mental health background? Yes. Yeah. So you're so a PhD, have, you're a doctor. PhD in counseling psychology. The singing um, PhD. All right. <laughs> My area of focus is marriage and family counseling specifically, uh, which has been uh, definitely needed in the midst of this pandemic. And yeah. so grateful to, to have that in my pedigree. So I don't know, Doc, I think you're just as busy in your oh. current job, your singing genre of, of music and uh, your PhD world. I, my clientele literally has quadrupled. Uh, in the midst of this uh, pandemic. And I was a former professor at NYU of psychology. And, you know, a lot of our community is now really sensing and adhering to the need to talk to someone to get the help that they actually do need and deserve. And so I'm grateful. Uh, I never advertise, uh, never advertise. Yeah. People just literally share through word of mouth. And it's kind of the same way with the music. And so I'm grateful for that as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I mean, I know we're here to talk about your music, but what you're doing on the other side is, is, is great also. And I, I'm sure it has a great impact in our community. And at this time, especially this time of need, people are reaching out to people like you to, to try to you know, get help. Because you know, a lot of people are gonna be traumatized and are traumatized awesome. based on what took place during this pandemic. Yes. A lot of us are just dealing with grief in itself. Grief yeah. is beyond death. Grief is just the loss of anything that is near and dear to you. So a lot of us are dealing with grief and, and services are available. Again, just to put a same shameless plug in for counseling in itself. It is yeah. available. Please adhere to it. You know, you're going to have to come back and put on a different hat because we need to talk yeah. about that because that's what's needed too. But we Absolutely. also need song and dance. And I understand you can dance. You get the James Brown steps and you we got the vocals to match it all up, to make it all happen. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. I'm grateful to uh, literally be recognized around the world. I have a great fan base over in Europe mm -hmm. and more people will know me by my footwork than by my vocals. And so uh, shucks. I'm glad that they know me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to wait until we open up our studios and you can come in and do the footwork and everything. We we'll put a microphone on the floor and all I'll be, you know, make it. <laughs> I'll be right there. You tell me when. You tell yeah. me when. So can you give us like a little pinch, a little taste of uh, your vocals? Oh, my goodness. I know we're not set up for it, but you know. But you know what? Hey, a singer sings. That's what we do. Uh, yeah. my, my latest uh, release, which was in June 2020, is entitled Holding On, which I know you have heard. Uh, yeah. And just that song of call to action for change of inequality and injustice. Just want to give a little bit of that. Uh, what happened to the days when we had less, but we loved more? If one had, we all had. If one needed, they just asked. We can leave those good times again. What you see now is not our end. No, 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 no. Baby, I need you to know it's not the end of the road. I want you to know. Change is gonna come. 
That's I'll what's up. I get emotional. <laughs> That's all right. We, no, no, we got to we got to get you in the in the Bronx Net Studios, and we'll, we'll turn would, it up. <laughs> absolutely, we'd love to come and share with you. Eric, where can we go to get more music, more to get more of a taste of what you do? Absolutely. You can find me on all digital music platforms under Eric B. Turner. Again, Eric B. Turner. Also on social media platforms, Eric B. Turner, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. <laughs> We're all over the place. Definitely yeah. hit me up on YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash Eric B. Turner. That's Eric with a C. Singer. Oh, they're calling for you right now. Look at that. You didn't I, get the phone I love it. Either. <laughs> Eric B. Turner, singer, Thanks. composer, lyricist, songwriter. He does it all. Thank you, Eric B. Thank you, sir. And come back again because we got to get you in there to see your footwork like we you mentioned come before. When I will be right there. You got it. Hey, thank you. We love you. Stay safe. Love you, brother. Peace and wellness to you. You got it. All right. Let's take a break. We've got more. More on open right here. Stay right there. Kick off your shoes and relax your feet and dance like this. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. It's another day, another way. Welcome back, everybody. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WPLS. And uh, I'm here with the guest. He's a director and choreographer of the Iris Project. And he joins us today to speak about his film, Wild Act One, and how it's uh, providing a platform for Black artists. So please welcome to the show, Jeremy McQueen. Jeremy, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? All right, great. Uh, welcome to the show. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and also the Black Iris Project. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Jeremy McQueen. I'm originally from San Diego, California, and I moved to New York about 16 years ago pursuing a career in dance and theater. Um, as a young kid, I was in love with the arts. My mom took me to see the Phantom of the Opera when it came on tour uh, to San Diego, and I was about eight years old. We rented binoculars sitting on the last row in the nosebleed section of this huge theater um, where I just really fell in love with live music, dance, theater, art, mm -hmm. being able to sit in these plush red seats and see oh, the beautiful wow. costumes, the scenery, the lighting, uh, the dancing, acting, everything about it just gave me chills and spoke to me in ways that and I've never experienced before. 
I yeah. did, yeah. Um, I looked at my mom after that performance and was like, I want more of this. I had no idea I could have a career or make a living uh -huh. as an artist. I just knew that it, it just provided me a source of inspiration and motivation and an opportunity to express myself in ways um, that I could step outside of my own body that I had never experienced. And the mom so, and dad opened know, up the checkbook, huh? They did. Yeah, they made a ton of financial sacrifices. My family yeah. was not wealthy by any means. Uh, they're originally from Alabama, growing up very poor and large families. Um, but they decided that when they moved to California, they were going to take a leap of faith, try something different and expose their child to all the things that they didn't get to experience at a young age. So I'm, I'm very grateful for them providing me so many opportunities to just learn more about myself and explore my own identity through art. Yeah. And now um, you're in it, a position to give back. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I took a huge leap of faith myself moving to New York, uh, yeah. not really knowing what that experience would be like, but just chasing this dream of wanting to have a career on Broadway and, and, and in the arts. And um, I've been so grateful and blessed to have been able to see so many of my dreams become realities, having danced in Wicked and The Color Purple and dancing on stage at the Metropolitan <laughs> Opera House. Um, but one thing that I always felt like I lacked was being able to see other people that looked like me in leadership roles as the director, as the choreographer, as the producer, um, and specifically telling stories that reflected my upbringing, my culture, my experience. And so in 2016, I decided it was time to start my own initiative. And I started the Black Iris Project, which is a ballet based collaborative that brings Black artists together of various different genres, specifically to create um, original classical and contemporary ballets that are rooted in Black history or the Black experience. Yeah, great. So how did you come up with the name, the Black Irish, uh, Iris Project? Correct. <laughs> um, I was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2012. And in an effort to get out of my house and find another experience to help me through mm -hmm. this process of, of understanding what she was going through, um, a friend of mine and I decided to go to the Met and we saw this painting just by happenstance called Black Iris Three by Georgia O'Keeffe. And it gave me this feeling, the exact same feeling that I got the first time I saw Fam of the Opera. So I immediately yeah. connected with childhood Jeremy and I wanted more of that painting. So I walked us all throughout the museum back to this painting so many different times. Um, and I then took how I was feeling about my mother and also just realizing and understanding the beauty of this painting, um, as well as the beauty of black women and the women that have helped raise me and make me who I am. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to honor that. And so I created a choreographic work called Black Iris. Um, it received a national award from the Joffrey Ballet. I got to create this huge ballet in Chicago and um, that opportunity just provided me a catalyst of, of inspiration of yeah. how we can further diversify the arts. You know, it's not enough just to have um, a Black dancer play the lead swan in Swan Lake. It, it's really something yeah. even more deep and meaningful when you can actually see stories that you can relate to played by people um, yeah. that resonate from your own culture. And yeah. so, um, you know, I loved that experience in, in 2012 and 13. And a few years later, after teetering back and forth between performing gigs, I decided, you know, it was time for me to kind of be the change that I wish to see in the world and start creating opportunities for other uh, Black go. creatives such as myself. Bravo. Jeremy, how important was it for you to create a platform uh, that champions visibility for local Black and Brown uh, artists? Oh, it was so important. You know, I think by my having that experience of going to see Phantom of the Opera for the first time, it changed the course of my entire life. You know, I, I wholeheartedly say that I am the the uh, byproduct or, or the the 
the end product of, of, of what arts um, exposure can really do for someone. It provides confidence and uh, creativity. And so being able to specifically see your own stories told through artistic mediums, it just opens so many windows of, of possibilities yeah. of where you can go in your life, despite the current circumstances that one may face. Um, and that's something that really inspired me and connects with the ballet that I've been working on, Wild Act One. And, and you're written up in the New York Times, I hear? Yeah, uh, we had a, um, it, it happened very quickly. Um, and I'm so grateful, uh, but we, we had a, a two page spread in the New York Times uh, recently. And uh, I was given an opportunity to share my voice and to also talk about the, the voices that we're aiming to amplify with this new ballet film, Wild Act One. How'd you feel about that? Oh, it was incredible. I mean, as a kid, it was always my dream to live in New York and to dance on the biggest stages and to be featured in the New York Times. It was it was always a huge dream of mine. Um, but to then actually see it become a reality and feel what that experience feels like, it's it's unmatched. There were uh, I still have no words to describe yeah. just how wow. a full circle it feels. Yeah. And now Wild Act One. Yeah, so Wild is part of a four-part series that I'm creating that specifically aims to highlight the voices of justice-involved youth, specific Black and Brown youth, um, who often see their voices go unheard or unrecognized. And so mm -hmm. I've been working with a number of organizations to um, gather artistic writings, paintings, materials that are written by youth involved in the justice system um, to really be able to capture the essence of the, some of the challenges that they go through, uh, both systemic challenges as well as just personal internal challenges of understanding what it's like on, on the, the mental process of, of growing up in a detention center, growing up in solitary confinement and how these really just harsh and cruel punishments can have long-term effects on, on early childhood development. Wow, That's, you put that all together, Wild Act One. Now, where can we see that? Wild Act One is streaming on our website, blackirisproject.org forward slash wild through April 4th. Um, but it's always been important to me that my Bronx community have an opportunity to experience my work first and All to right. experience it as free or as discounted as possible. So there are two screenings that are coming up. Um, we've partnered with BronxNet uh, as we have many times um, to screen the film on BronxNet television station uh, coming up soon. I'm not sure exactly what those dates are, but I'm sure they'll put them on the screen. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, 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 we'll take care of all of that. Don't even worry about a thing. Don't worry about a thing. Um, website, social media, where do we go? Yeah, to learn more about the Black Iris Project or to make a donation to help us to continue to amplify Black voices, Black lives, Black stories, you can visit blackirisproject.org. And we are also on Instagram at Black Iris Project. There you go. Jeremy, thank you so much, man. We appreciate you and thank you for all the great work that you, you're putting out. You know, a lot of, of people course. are proud of you. I know that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Jeremy McQueen, director and choreographer, Wild Act One. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay safe. God bless. Thank you, you too. All right. We'll take a break. We've got more. Don't go anywhere. We'll hook you up next.
Welcome back, everybody. I'm the Doc Bob Lee, and our next guests are the founder and the creative specialist for Bronx Writers, and they join us today to promote their latest projects, the Bronx Writers Bookshelf and Bronx Writers Anthology 2. Please welcome to the show Annabelle Incarnation and Josue Caceres. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. What's up? What's up? Thank you for having us. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Nice to see you again. Tell Same us all here. about it. You got you got part two going on, but uh, tell us about the Bronx Writers again for people who are just tuning in for the first time. Uh, Bronx Writers Bookshelf and what inspired the idea behind it? Definitely. So uh, for those that don't know, uh, BX Writers is a platform uh, where we showcase and highlight local writers, authors, creatives uh, from our own community. Uh, and one of the projects that we're working on is the BX Writers Bookshelf. And what that is, is we're taking local authors self-published from our community and we're having them showcase and sell their book at the Bronx Native Shop. You know, yeah. uh, far too often, you know, we see the challenges that self-published authors have to go through, you know, to market their book and sell it. Uh, some of these challenges, I faced them early on. And, uh, you know, we decided to create this platform uh, so these stories can be told and they can be heard. You know, um, we, we truly believe that representation matters and, yeah. and people need to be able to, to pick up these books and look at themselves and, and see themselves in these characters and in these stories. So, you know, we have so many diverse books at the moment. We have children books, comic books, uh, books of poetry, magazines. We also have our own books all at this one location uh, uh, telling our story. You know, so um, if you're a local author that's interested, you know, hit us up, come through, follow us, BX Writers, and uh, let's make it happen. You, you know, we, we truly care about our community and, and its literary scene. And Josue, you know how to do it because uh, you, you have a couple of books out. But uh, Annabelle, you're an educator. And yes, this is I what am. you love. Talk yes. about it. <laughs> yeah, so... Um... Thank you for having us again. Um, as you mentioned before, I'm a creative specialist uh, for BX Writers with BX Writers. Um, and yes, as an educator, I am really passionate about um, teaching and, and learning. Um, and as an educator, you also have to put your, your you have to put yourself in the position of the learner as well. Yeah, um, and I get to do that with, with BX writers by being a creative specialist because I have to put myself in the position of how to better engage with our audience. Um, and another project that we currently have going on is the second anthology. So we wanted to build from the success Ooh. of the first anthology and it has led us to the second anthology. But the focus for the second anthology is celebrating in a very unapologetic, unapologetic oh, way the Bronx you're an educator you know uh, how did you guys meet and tell us about some of the things how you you know what you did to get involved yes yeah, so actually it's a it's a funny story um I had just undergrad uh graduated undergrad um yeah. and I had dedicated the first six months of me graduating undergrad or after graduating undergrad to focusing on you uh -huh. know uh my teaching skills and then finally when I got to the point where I felt like I can you know, have a social life again. Um, I saw that Josue was um, releasing his first, his second book, and yeah. I went to the publishing party, and that's where we met. And ever since then, we just kind of been working together on and off until recently, um, where I offici officially became the um, creative specialist for BX Writers. Right, right, right. So now you have Anthology Volume Two. Yes, I became involved um, in the second anthology through um, my personal friendship with Josue. Uh, we've uh -huh. worked together unofficially um, multiple times. And so now I, uh, I am part of BX Writers officially as a creative specialist. Um, and so we're really hoping to highlight the Bronx with the second anthology um, uh -huh. and not just highlight it, but celebrate it and, and really focus on it, um, the, the good, the bad and the ugly. <laughs> um, but 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 through focusing on that, maybe yeah. just raising this awareness that the Bronx is not this terrible place. The, the Bronx is no longer burning um, and we need to celebrate that. And that's what yeah. we hope to do with the second anthology. How can local writers get more involved in what you guys are doing? 
Um, well, we have a lot of upcoming events for the summer. Hopefully with this, you know, with the vaccine and with herd immunity, we can go back to regular life, whatever that means, you know, post pandemic. Um, but also, um, if you follow us at BX Writers on Instagram, on our uh, bio, you will see the link to submit yeah. your works um, to, for the, to be submitted to the uh, second anthology, to be considered. Josue, one and two, huh? It's been a long road, right? Yeah, definitely, man. Uh, it, it's definitely been a, a long time coming. But, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, like I said, we, we truly care about our community and, and it's literary scene. So, you know, it, it has to be done. We have to make it happen, you know? Is there volume three coming up or, or what? What's the next project? Oh, man, we have so many projects uh, in the works. You know, we're developing them now. Uh, you know, we want to definitely continue uh, publishing authors, writers, uh, uh, going to magazines, you know, uh, now that the weather is getting warmer and, and things are starting to open back up, we definitely want to start the events. Um, we just announced that we have a partnership with PEN America. Woo! Uh, yes, which is, um, you know, a, a network of, of literary organizations that, that fight for the freedom of expression. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's a really great time right now. So, so we're just trying to make it happen for our people. There are a lot of people out there who want to express themselves through writing and they just don't know where to start and you guys know how to do it. So uh, I'm sure people are going to be reaching out to you. Is there a website or something that they can go to to find out more about what you're doing and, and try to see if they can get involved with making that first step, putting the pen, where's that pen? Putting <laughs> the pen to the paper. Yes, <laughs> so definitely. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram uh, at bxwriters. Uh, you can also check us out on the Bronx Native website. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's really a, a, a new platform that, that we've been working on. And uh, there's definitely going to be uh, more things to come. But definitely check us out. You can hit us up, DM us, email us. Uh, uh, we're always open to work with our people. And uh, Annabelle, are people, are students back in school yet? You usually... You're... The yes. virtual right now, right? Most of yes. them. So I am, I am a, a fully remote teacher. Uh, however, the other, my co-teacher my, in the great team, she has um, in-person students and they take turns coming in. But all of my students are fully remote. I come into the school building more of as a policy that the principal instituted. I come to, to two days a week, just kind of for checking in or making sure everybody's all, all right, that I'm not like in Puerto Rico or something in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, listen. Thank you for your service. You know, you're a frontline worker and we appreciate you and love you. Thank Thanks. both of you guys for teaching others how to uh, get what they need out of life by way of uh, expressing themselves through uh, either becoming an author or, you know, putting the pen to the paper and doing what they think they love, writing. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Give us that website one more time. Yes. Uh, check us out Instagram, BX Writers. Also, uh, bronxnative.com, uh, you could check out our books on that website. And uh, also come through uh, to the Bronx Native Shop, 127 Lincoln Avenue, and check out the BX Writers Bookshelf. There you go. Bronx Writers Bookshelf Project. And we got the Bronx Writer BX. I'm going to go like this. BX, BX Writers. Sure. There you go. <laughs> Josue Caceres and Annabelle Incarnation. Did I, did I chop it up at the end? No, you, got it. you got it you got it <laughs> <laughs> we love you guys and thank you so much once again thank, thank you. you so much for having, for having us. us god bless stick around for a while because i have uh if you're into sports bobby c has the latest in the world of sports he's going to give it to you right after this on open
We are very excited this morning to talk about a project in the Bronx that is evoking the name of a local legend from long ago. Frankie Frisch is a baseball Hall of Famer who played for the New York Giants in the 20s and later with the St. Louis Cardinals in the 30s. He managed a slew of baseball teams, a three-time All-Star as a player, finished with a career batting average of 316, was NL MVP in 1931, and won four World Series in total. Frisch was born and raised right here in the Bronx, attended Fordham Prep and later Fordham University, where he starred in four sports, baseball, football, basketball, and track. His speed earned him the nickname the Fordham Flash. And now a field in the Bronx bearing his name is getting renovations to bring baseball back to the neighborhood. To tell us more about it, we bring in Executive Director for Friends of Mashaloo Parkland, Elizabeth Quaranta. Good morning, Elizabeth. How are you? Hello, good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you about this, and I was hoping that you could tell us more about this renovation and how you have championed to get funding for it through New York City Council member for District 11, Andrew Cohen. So on behalf of Friends of Mashaloo Parkland, um, we have been collaborating together with the Bedford Mashaloo Neighborhood Association, President Barbara Sustranza, and um, together we have... Uh, have reached out to councilmen so that we can get this very well needed field um you know funded it's it's a very well loved field by the old timers um but it hasn't been really used in the past couple of years and so we were afraid that we were going to lose that that field um a couple of playgrounds have been renovated but there was no mention of of the field so uh, between both organizations, um, we, we felt that it was a gem in this community, which is why we, um, you know, which is why we really worked aggressively getting getting the five million dollars that it's going to take to renovate this field. Oh, that's excellent. I love the backdrop for you, too, on our virtual format. Nice yes. Stuff. So thanks to the New York Historical Society. <laughs> this is a, a picture of the real um, Frisch Field um and uh and those are real people sitting in the bleachers that hold 3200 people so what was the community input from new york city parks in february before going to the design phase for this project so you know you had mentioned something really important and that was the fact that um uh frankie frisch was called the fordham flash and that was you know he had all these skills he had the football he had the basketball he had the track he had the baseball so even though the community old timers um wanted to keep the field just as a baseball field fast forward we're in 2021 we have a lot of community members that come from diverse cultures and backgrounds and so there's a lot of different athletic um, games that they play. So we wanted to incorporate all of the uh, other skills that Frankie Frisch had. And so uh, some of the renovations that came up, ideas for, you know, for the renovations was having a track around the field, good for one or two people, jogging, power walking outside near the perimeter of the fence. Um, the other idea was to have a single or double unit basketball court at the end by the botanical square, but nothing to interfere with the actual game of playing baseball. You know, so we wanted to leave the field uh, receded, uh, put new sod in, get in new dugouts. Um, but that was the one thing that was that is a priority to us was not to to change the field in any way, but to bring homage to the person who it's named after. I know that you said that you're grateful to have agencies and partners who are helping to make this happen. I mean, how much excitement is there around this project? Because the neighborhood must feel as lucky as you guys to have this field basically in their backyard and have the opportunity to have baseball back. We are working with Parks and Recreation, Bedford Marshallu, uh, uh, Community Board 7. We, we do also uh, work with Montefiore Community Center because they also have a, um, a team. And hopefully the 52 Precinct because I did find out recently that the, uh, that the terrain of the field actually used to belong to the 52 Precinct um many many moons ago and so it'd be nice to see some games maybe you know from you know from them so it is exciting we do want to bring the game 
back into the minds of the youth that we have in the area. So for all of us, we watch, um, you know, the series and the old timers, but for the youth that is com you know, coming up, it's great that they're into soccer and they're into the volleyball, but we do want to um, keep our baseball tradition, the, um, the you know, American tradition. Um, so it is definitely going to be a, not just a place to play games, but it's also gonna be an a, um, educational field. I think there's definitely a goal, even by Major League Baseball, to bring the game back to the youth, uh, regardless of color or sex even. That's right, that's right. And we have, you know, famous players. So we need that representation here. In your mind, still, what are the benefits, in your opinion, of having sportsmanship, games, and, and basically programming at this field that, like you said, really hasn't had much going on recently? Well, one of the other things that we are focusing on is how to make sure that our, our tight-knit uh, community stays tight-knit. We have an exponential housing development in the area. Um, it, the Webster Avenue has been rezoned, and so it has o opened up for a lot of buildings that are seven to eight units, over 80 to 100 units per building. So before we get too city-like, um, we really need to have things like this in place so that it's it, it remains a community that is safe and that is healthy. Um, so it's really important to keep Frischfield, you know, intact and and ready to and you know and ready for the community to use. You know, your organization is grassroots. I know that uh, from talking to you before this interview that you know you still have a few things that you would like to continue to work on with the Parks Department. They will not cover portable lighting for night games or a large scoreboard some of the things that you guys have discussed but they will cover the renovation and the new ground natural turf uh, new dugouts etc but what's next you know so how can how can people help out maybe to to actually finish the project the way that you would like it to be finished so right now we're at a point where input has been collected i'm sure they'll they'll accept a few more um, because the designers are just getting their heads together. Um, there has been a lot of input though, and there were people who, who sent in um, their mock-ups and I, which we thought was so sweet. Um, and so the designers are gonna, you know, look at what's, what is, um, you know, what the goal is, uh, which is gonna take a while. Um, I think the best thing that we can all do is to continue to, um, you know, to support the project, to come out and volunteer and keeping the area um, still safe and clean, join with um, some of our clean streets initiative. Um, so that, that has to keep going um, so that we can continue, you know, that habit even when the field, you know, reopens up again. Um, other ways is maybe to get a couple of uh, small businesses and agencies, organizations to pool in for the other things that we that we can't get because it's not covered under the five million. So we, we definitely cannot cover um, the portable lighting. It would be great to have um, evening games. Um, you know, when it turns dusk. You know, just 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 for safety's sake and to see the ball, um, among other things. So we, we, and the other thing that we're going to be needing is the scoreboard. I mean, who doesn't want to keep score? I think it would be awesome to, to, to bring that whole um, image of having the players go up and change the scoreboard, you know, numbers. So all kinds of support would be helpful. Friends of Mashalu Parkland's mission is to engage the Bedford Park and Norwood communities to garden, grow, and develop fostering practices of environmental sustainability. Elizabeth, thank you for getting and growing some more baseball here in the Bronx, too. Very exciting. Uh, thank you for having me, and um, you know, and we are, and we are certainly looking forward to uh, continuing. Um, to honor Frankie Fish in this 86-year-old baseball field as of this year. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet.
Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at BronxNet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. BronxNet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> BronxNet. <laughs> everybody of the doc bob lee from wbls and bronx nets open and our next guest is a housing organizer and civic leader he's running for city council district 14 in the boogie down bx and he joins us today to speak about his plans to build a better bronx please welcome to the show adolfo abreu how are you thank you i'm doing good how are you doing good good congratulations before it happens <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's been a nice journey. Yeah, yeah. And I see mom is always helping you out, huh? <laughs> yes, my mom has been there day one. Single mom has always been supporting me since uh, 1993. Yeah. And you, you're, you talk about housing. You, you have a housing background because you came through a lot, right? You survived uh, a lot growing up. Uh, you struggled in the Bronx, um, survived off the of food stamps and all that. Speak about that. Yeah, I, you know, like I said, you know, I've been living in this neighborhood all my life, 28 years. I live in 196 in Morris, raised by a single mother. Uh, my mom has done a lot just to make sure that her and I were able to survive. Uh, she was making 450 an hour as a home health aide in the 90s, having to get on food stamps just so that her and I could survive. And by the time I was 13, we had moved to four different apartment buildings, all in the same neighborhood because of affordability issues. So when I'm talking about housing, uh, it's important to me because I lived it. And also, it's an important issue in this uh, council district. And what inspired you to run? <laughs> what inspired me to run is, you know, all of that that my mom and I went through when I was younger, in addition to going to PS86 uh, when I was young. And that school is still overcrowded. It's still one of the most overcrowded school districts in the city. Um, and I was one of those kids who had to be bused to a school in the South Bronx because there was not a seat for me in my own school. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't until I joined an organizing community uh, by the name of the North First Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition that I learned that what my mom and I went through was a common struggle for immigrant and working class communities in the Bronx, but that it was possible for us to change it if collectively uh, we stood together to just advocate for much needed changes in our laws and in resources just to transform the Bronx to make it work for us. What do you want your potential constituents to know about you in District 14? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm a community organizer, so I, I know it's important to uh, center the needs of the people in the district when it comes to policy making, when it comes to our budgets, when it comes just even just decision making overall. I think it's more important to to, to lead with the the, the ethos and, and the belief that those who are most impacted need to be at the center of the decision making table. I think more often than not, we hear politicians who say, I'm going to listen to you, but I think we want more than listening. I think our communities want to be invited to the table of governance and actually 
uh, have real concrete decision making power alongside their elected officials. Yeah. And what are some of the issues that you tackle or try to tackle um, if elected? Yep. So we earlier we talked about housing. So that's top one of the agenda, making sure that we're building deep and permanent affordable housing. Second, mm -hmm. allow the opportunity for our tenants to have ownership of their buildings, whether it's through the Community Opportunity to Purchase Act or with uh, via community land trusts. Second, I think is, is health. We need to make sure that our pu uh, public hospitals are not privatized, that they're receiving as much resources to provide care to our communities. Um, and also that the, the, the workers in the hospitals feel safe, whether it's on safe staffing levels um, and have all the necessary tools just to kind of uh, continue caring for our communities. And lastly, just education, because I lived it again, uh, our schools are still overcrowded, so we need to build more schools. They're underfunded, so we need to provide and uh, fight for resources that are owed from the state um, and just ensure that uh, our school system is in investing in our development. Good. Talk about some of the challenges that your community and the city at large has faced during this pandemic, you know, everybody's had a, a tough time. Um, mm. Do you have all the testing that you need there? Do you have um, uh, everybody getting vaccinated uh, on time? Um, is that is do you still have a, a large number of people who are hesitant about doing it? Uh, what are some of the challenges? Yeah, I mean, in the, in, in the Bronx, I think for us Bronxites, we know that we were experiencing crises before this pandemic, right? Whether in terms of rent burden. Uh, this council district was, has the highest eviction rates uh, in the city. And now right now with the eviction moratorium being lifted, they have the highest eviction rate filing. So there's a real uh, crisis in housing that's always been there. So we have to mitigate that. Uh, in terms of uh, vaccine rollout, yeah. I think there's a lot of folks who might still not know that uh, they can get tested at St. James Park. Um, I still run into people on the street who don't know that they could go to St. James Park and get some testing. So one, there still needs to be more outreaching so that folks can uh, aware about testing sites near where they live, but also even vaccination. I think the, the biggest struggle has been language justice, uh, vaccine appointments being available, because mm -hmm. sometimes people check, they check for a multitude of weeks and haven't been able to get appointments. So we need to up those numbers there just to make sure that our, our people feel safe and secure. Yeah, absolutely. Where can we go to find out mm. more about this wonderful person who's running for office? <laughs> yeah, so you could you know, go to adolfo.nyc just to learn more about me and my platform. Uh, we have six different sections of our platform on housing, health, education, participatory democracy, economic development, and safety. Um, and we made our platform in a very interactive uh, manner because we really believe in co-governance and listening to our community. So folks can right now go to the, our platform read what's there and give us feedback. Let us know if you like what you see on the housing section, or if you think I missed the mark on something, let us know. I'm reading those comments because I think it's important to have this conversation now as we're going into office so that on day one, we already know what, what needs to get done and we can resume those conversations that we had while we were campaigning. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and, and everything else. There you go. Facebook and Twitter, where do we go? So Adolfo for Council. Uh, so that's how you'll be able to find us. Number four, right? Yes, number four. All right. Give a big virtual hug to mom. Well, you give her a real one, okay? Because I know I heard mom is helping you out a lot. <laughs> she has. She has. She's she's more excited. I, I've been telling her that she should run. You know, they, yeah, she's, she's been putting with you. Coming up. She's running with me. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of sneakers are you guys wearing? Ooh, uh, I think she has some new balances. I've been there rocking go. dress shoes, but I've been like putting orthopedic so that I might my, my feet don't like, you know, kind of uh, give out on me by the end of the campaign because it's rough, you know, being out there oh, and yeah. walking on this concrete, yeah. you know. <laughs> I hear you're pounding the pavement, man. And thank you for all that you're doing. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you. Lots of love to you guys. Well, thank you so much, Adolfo Abreu, running for city council. Good luck to you. God bless you. And uh, we hope everything turns out okay for you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank our guests for joining us, you, our viewers, for tuning in and checking it all out. You can keep following us on BronxNet TV for continued coverage. I want to thank you for letting us share in this space and time with you. I want to thank our crew from BronxNet, all of, all of our wonderful producers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't thank you enough. For all of us here at BronxNet, mwah. Always remember this, what you are is God's gift to you and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice and let your choice control the chooser of the Dr. Bob Lee. I'll catch you over 107.5 WPLS. I love you all. Peace.